Welcome to Peninsula Seniors Out and About. Today we're at the Western Museum of Flight in Torrance for one of their celebrity lectures. Let's go see what Cindy has for us today. Welcome everyone to the Western Museum of Flight. I'm Cindy Maka, the director. Just about everyone who retires faces the decision about what to do in retirement. Steve Snyder seems to have found that ideal project. After retiring from a 36-year career in national sales management, Steve decided to follow up on the fascinating stories his father had shared with him about the experience of being a B-17 pilot flying combat missions over Europe. As a result, and in addition to the fascinating personal saga that his father shared, Steve's investigations have enabled him to build a thorough and insightful background study of the lives, the hazards, and the results of American bomber forces in World War II. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Steve Snyder. I'm delighted to be here today uh, at the museum and at historic uh, Zamperini Field. I read Unbroken uh, early in my uh, investigations and research. In fact, I think I, I read it before it ever got popular. And in fact, I just uh, saw the movie Unbroken a couple days ago. I never met Louis, but he was obviously a true hero and a great inspiration. My only wish is that he'd gone to UCLA rather than SC. <laughs> Uh, growing up, I knew the basic story of my dad's uh, war history. I knew he was a B-17 pilot. He was stationed in England. Uh, he flew a B-17, which was named after my oldest sister, Susan Ruth, who was one year old at the time that he went overseas. My mother's name was Ruth. That he flew bombing missions with the 8th Air Force over Europe. He was shot down over Belgium. He was missing in action for seven months, but he evaded capture. Unfortunately, he made it back through the war or else I wouldn't be here today. Uh, my, uh, my belief uh, that it would be a good book or, or a movie was justified by the fact that uh, two books were written, one by Gerald Astor called The Mighty Eighth, which is about the Eighth Air Force based in England, who flew high altitude daylight bombing missions over Europe during World War II. It was named the Mighty Eighth because of the number of planes it could put up in the sky. Uh, during missions, they had hundreds of planes, and at the war, they even had one mission where they flew 2,000 bombers and 1,000 fighters. The other book was called First Over Germany by uh, Russell Strong. It was about the 306 bomb group that my dad was in. Uh, Russell Strong was a navigator in the 306 bomb group and became the historian of the bomb group after the war. They were, uh, their motto was first over Germany because the 306 was the first bomb group to hit a target in Germany in January of 1943. But it wasn't until I retired in 2009 that I had the time to really delve into my dad's uh, war history. They had kept a lot of material from the war years. Uh, my mother had kept uh, letters that were written by crew members, uh, relatives, uh, Belgium friends, my dad had kept all his uh, war records and orders. Uh, my dad had written a diary while he was missing in action about the plane being shot down, very detailed diary. But the most significant item were all the letters that my dad had written to my mother while he was stationed in England. Reading those were absolutely fascinating and I became fascinated uh, with them and I just wanted to learn more and more. I then went on a quest to try to find crew, uh, relatives of crew members and I was successful in finding relatives of all the crew except the bombardier, about 50 in all. And I asked them if they could provide me with anything, uh, letters, pictures, newspaper articles, uh, anything that they could have to help me gain further information. I read book after book after book about the air war in Europe. And I went on the internet and spent countless and countless hours doing research. I downloaded lots of declassified military documents, uh, bomb uh, mission reports, squadron di diaries, uh, war crimes reports, and the like. I, I joined a number of World War II associations and started going to a lot of reunions to listen to veterans tell their stories. In fact, I'm vice president of the 306 bomb group. 
It wasn't until 2012 that I actually decided to write a book. It was never my intention to, to begin with to, to write a book. But after uh, learning as much as I did, I thought the story of my dad and his crew was just so fascinating and so amazing that it had to be told and people needed to read about it. And the book was published uh, just last year in August of 2014. Early on, I found out it wasn't gonna be a book just about my father. It was gonna be about the book of each member of the crew. And furthermore, it was gonna be about all the Belgian people that risked their lives to help them after they were shot down. I probably wouldn't have written the book if it wasn't for the efforts of two gentlemen. Uh, here in the upper left-hand corner is Paul Delahaye with my dad. Uh, this picture was taken in 1994 at the 50th anniversary of the liberation of Belgium and of my dad's plane being shot down. And the other gentleman was Jacques Lelot, seen here with me just this last fall at the 70th celebration of the liberation of Belgium. These two gentlemen were young boys during the war, and they saw firsthand the atrocities that the Germans and the Nazis inflicted upon their families and their people and their communities. As they got older in life, they became local historians, and they interviewed lots of Belgium citizens and members of the underground to record their testimony about what took place during that time. And fortunately for me, and I'm so grateful for them for their research and documentation because they provided me with so many details that happened 70 years ago that I never would have known about uh, without their efforts. Everything in the book is factual. It's based on firsthand testimony by the people that were involved in the events that took place. I did add a lot of historical information and antidotes about and surrounding the war, but I thought it would give it background and context. And I was, as I mentioned, it was just published this last fall. I've really been pleased with the reception it's received. Uh, it's won 11 book awards in the 10 months that it's been out. Initially, my dad didn't even enlist in the Air Force. As a result of President Roosevelt's first peacetime draft in history, he enlisted in the Army in April of 1941. He was stationed at Fort Lewis, Washington, and this is a picture of him in his combat gear. Uh, at the time, the U.S. military was woefully weak. They ranked 18th in the world in military power. And they were very ill-equipped as well, as you can see by his uniform. It's World War I vintage. The following July, my dad married Ruth Hempel, who was born and raised in Pasadena, California. My dad was actually born in Glendale, and he moved to California when he was 12. It was shortly after she graduated from UCLA. Uh, that December, uh, following closely the, on the heels of December 7th, Pearl Harbor, uh, she went up to visit my dad uh, over Christmas in Washington, and nine months later, Susan Ruth was born. Well, my dad was feeling a little pressure at this time. He had a, a new bride and a baby on the way, and he thought, well, how am I going to support him on an army private's pay? I need to find a way to make more money. So he decided to volunteer for the Air Force because he thought he could make a more income there, especially if he could make it through pilot school and become an officer. So in June of 1942, he entered the uh, cadet training program for the Air Force. Uh, he began pre-flight training at Santa Ana, California, and then he went through the three stages of pilot training. There's three stages in pilot training. Uh, primary training, which he took at Santa Maria, then basic training, took that in Arizona and in uh, California, and then he graduated from basic training. And in basic training, after the, the pilots graduated, they were divided into two groups. One group went into fighter planes or single engine planes, and the other group went into multi-engine planes or bombers. Uh, usually the smaller in stature pilots went into fighter planes because the cockpits were so small. My dad was 6'3", so they put him into bombers. But also it was based on personality. Uh, the, the fighter pilots tended to be more indiv individualistic, a uh, little more uh, risk takers, a little cocky, brasher. Uh, the, the bomber pilots tended to be more level-headed and more team players. This is a picture of my dad in uh, primary training. Uh, back then, I think everyone smoked. And this, you see the three types of planes that my dad flew in the pilot training. In primary, he flew a 
biplane, Stearman PT-13. Then he went to a single engine plane in basic training and then to, uh, to an engine plane in advanced training. He graduated from advanced training in Douglas, Arizona in April of 1943 where he received his pilot's wings and it's commissioned to a second lieutenant. And after that, he went into transitional training where he learned how to fly a B-17. And then he went into operational combat crew training where all the members of the crew came together and they learned to operate at a as a team. Then on October 21st of 1943, they were assigned overseas to England to the 306 bomb group stationed at Thurlie, England. This is a picture of the base at that time. The base itself is not there anymore. There's a real nice little museum there. My wife and I visited there last August and it's a beautiful little area. The surrounding area pretty much looks the same. It's all rural farmland, little country roads running through the countryside dotted by little hamlets and, and villages. Here you have the emblem of the 306th bomb group. There were three air divisions in the 8th Air Force. Uh, the 306 bomb group was in the 1st Air Division, which was signified by a triangle, as you can see in the logo here. And within each Air Division, there were four combat wings. The 306 was in the 1st Combat Wing, which was signified by the color yellow, you can see in the circle. And then the 306 bomb group was designated by the letter H. Some of you might remember the movie 12 O'Clock High, starring Gregory Peck. Well, that was based on a true story about the 306 bomb group. The fictional, uh, fictitious bomb group named in the movie, the 918th, was derived by multiplying the 306 by three. <laughs> Very creative. There were four uh, bomb squadrons with each bomb group. Here are the squadrons within the 306. On the upper left-hand side, you have the eager beavers, and then to the left, or your right, uh, you have the clay pigeons, so named by a journalist because they took such heavy losses during the war. And then down to the lower left, you have the, the grim reapers, and then my dad's squad, the fight and bite in 369th. This is a picture of the 369th ground crew, and all, they were kind of uns, unsung heroes. They didn't get the glory that the combat crews did, but they were vital to the operations. Uh, when the planes came in from a mission, they stayed up all night long uh, doing maintenance on the planes, doing lots of uh, repair damage to the, the, they took during the, uh, during the mission. In the morning, then they had to refuel the planes, load new bombs on it, and then reload it with ammunition for the machine guns. So I always like to uh, point them out for their sacrifice and dedication. Here you have a picture of my dad's crew. Uh, the B-17 had a 10-man crew. It had four officers, and they were on, they're kneeling in this picture. My dad is to the far left. He was the first pilot. Then next to him, you have a co-pilot, then the navigator and the bombardier. And then the six enlisted men, or non-commissioned officers, NCOs, are standing behind them. They were mainly gunners. Uh, I loved the nose art they had on the planes during that time. Uh, the crews were very creative in what they named their planes and what they painted on their planes. Uh, sometimes it was cartoon characters, but more often than, than not, it was scantily clad or nude women. <laughs> After all, these guys were 20 years old, some as young as 18 or 19. Uh, it was interesting to note that the Air Force is the only entity that allowed their planes to be painted. The uh, Navy, Marines, Army did not, uh, neither did any other country allow the planes to be painted. But the Air Force thought it helped the morale of the, of the men if they could paint their planes. Uh, 306 flew B-17s. This is a picture of a B-17G. There were two models of B-17s flown during the war, an F model and a G model. The main distinguishing feature is the chin turret. You can see under the nose on the G model. They were nicknamed the Flying Fortress because of the firepower they had from the 12 to 13 machine guns on the plane. They were uh, twin guns in the chin turret. They had two cheek guns on either side of the plane. Then you had a twin guns on the top turret. Sometimes you had a gun above the radio operator. Then you had a ball turret gunner with twin guns two waist gunners, and then twin guns and the tail. Each plane was identified with tail markings. 
And on this plane, again, you can see the triangle of the 1st Division, the yellow stripe of the 40th Combat Wing, the H for the 306 Bomb Group. And then each squadron had the tip of the plane painted, the 369th with green, and then each plane had an identification tail number. This slide, you see the crew positions on the plane. Up in front, you have the bombardier in the nose, and behind him, the navigator. Then up above them were the pilots, first pilot and co-pilot. Standing above them was the flight engineer, top turret gunner, then the radio operator, ball turret gunner, the two waist gunners, and then the tail gunner. The bomb bay is in between the, the flight engineer, top turret gunner, and the radio operator and the bombs hung on each side of the plane. And it's really cramped in here. I don't know if you can see this too well, but there's a narrow catwalk that goes between uh, the bombs. You can see how narrow that is. It's only eight inches wide, and this boy is only eight years old. So you can imagine a full-grown man walking through there. And then again, you can see the bombs on either side of that. Uh, during bombing missions, occasionally the bombs would get hung up and one of the crew members would have to go try to release them, either take a wrench and beat on them to knock them free, or you just kick them loose. You can imagine what it must have been like when you're five miles above the air, looking straight down at the earth, wind howling around you, and you're trying to get those bombs out. It took a lot of bravery. So here you have a better position of the crew members. Uh, the bombardier in front, again, obviously his main job was to uh, drop the bombs accurately, but again, during attack, to man the chin turret. And behind him was the navigator who needed to know where they were and where they were going. And then above them, you have the pilots again. And obviously, one reason they have two pilots is that if one is injured or, or killed, you have another guy to fly the plane. But also you needed to fly the, the two pilots to share the duties of flying the plane. And these missions lasted eight to 12 hours and they were very grueling. Uh, in addition, they had to fight uh, turbulence, you know, really two types of turbulence. One is the air turbulence, just from storms. And if any of you experienced being in a commercial plane when you've hit turbulence, it gets pretty rocky. The other type of turbulence were from all the planes being in the, in the sky all the wake turbulence uh, thrown off. It was like kind of like a lake. If there's one boat in the lake, it's nice and smooth, but if you have boats cruising all around the lake, it gets real choppy. So it took uh, a lot of strain, both med med medically, mentally, and physically to fly these planes, and that's why you needed two, two pilots. And then you have the flight engineer above them and during the attack. He had to man the top turret gun, but also he looked over the pilot's shoulders to monitor the instruments of the plane, mainly fuel consumption and engine performance. This is a view of the instruments in the plane. There were over 150 different dials and gauges and toggles and switches that they had to keep their eyes on. It was a very complicated plane to fly. Here you have the uh, radio operator. That was the most comfortable position on the plane. He got that nice chair to sit in. The little compartment was pretty roomy. And then below him was the ball turret gunner. And this position was probably the most uncomfortable in the plane. Here you have a picture of what uh, he looks like. Again, flying you know, eight, 12 hours in a fetal position, crammed up, was pretty tough. Then following them, you have the two waste gunners. Uh, that was the most exposed position on the plane. And the F model B-17s, those windows were open, so it was really cold in there. And then in the tail, you have the, the tail gunner, which was also another cramped position. Finally, on November 3rd of 1994, my dad flew his first mission. It was the first time uh, the 8th Air Force put up over 500 aircraft uh, on a mission to Wilhelmshaven. And flying combat missions was dangerous from the moment you took off to the moment you came back to base. To begin with, uh, there were 40 bomb groups based in England, and on a mission, there were hundreds of bombers taken off from these bases all at the same time. Uh, this graph gives you a little idea. It's not the scale at all. But uh, back then, there was no air traffic control. There was no radar. It's all based on visual sight. And usually the English weather was overcast and you couldn't see anything until you got above the clouds, so mid-air collisions were not uncommon. 
Once you got above the clouds, then they had to form up. So squadrons formed up into groups, groups formed up into wings, wings formed up into divisions, and then divisions formed up. And this took a long time, typically an hour to two hours before they could even head across the channel to begin their bombing mission. Then they had to deal with the elements. Uh, these planes were not pressurized, so it was extremely cold, typically minus 40 to 60 degrees below zero. And they also you needed to be on oxygen above 10,000 feet. If you didn't go on oxygen above that level, you'd pass out and in 10 minutes you'd be dead. Here you see a typical combat uniform of a waste gunner. He's wearing his combat helmet on top, his goggles, which are tinted because of the brightness of the sun at that high altitude. Again, his goggles, his fleece lined jacket, his thermal gloves and boots and pants. He's wearing a flak jacket. It was an apron that had uh, metal sheets in front and back. And then you can just barely see the parachute harness beneath the flak jacket. They didn't actually wear their parachutes in the plane. The harnesses had hooks on the back and if they needed to bail out, they'd, then they'd pick up their parachute beside them and hook them on and, and, and bail out. And then once they got to the mainland coast of Europe, they had to deal with enemy fighters. Here you see a picture of a waste gunner firing his 50 caliber machine gun. Again, his uh, goggles and uh, flak jacket on, spent cartridges all over the ground. At the beginning of the war, it was the 8th Bomber Command's belief that these B-17s, with all their firepower and flying in formations, could defend themselves from enemy fighters. Here you see a, a diagram of a combat box formation. The wing formation is a box, and then within the wing formation, you have three bomb groups, each in a box. Within each bomb group, you have three bomb squadrons, also in a box. Here's another view uh, on the upper portion of the screen. You see what the formation looks like from above to the left of the screen. You'll see what it looks like from behind or in front. And then to the right of the screen, you see what it looks like from the side. You might be able to see the, uh, the green and blue dots uh, there. The guys that were in those planes, they were called Tail End Charlie. And if you were in the low bomb group, the low plane, that was called the Purple Heart Corner because you were so susceptible and open to uh, attack by fighter planes. During 1942 and 1943, the Eighth Air Force took devastating losses. Uh, culminating in uh, the fall of 1943 was what was known as Black Week. During a four-mission four uh, period of time, they lost 150 planes, that's 1,500 men. Uh, the worst day was Black Thursday, the second Schweinfurt raid, where they lost 60 aircraft out of 219. Uh, the 306 bomb group lost 10 out of 15 planes itself. Finally, the 8th Air Force realized that they needed to give the bombers air support. And so they got that with P-38s and P-47s, but the problem with that was that they had limited fuel capacity. They could only accompany the planes just past the continental coast of Europe, then they had to turn around and head back to England. Well, the Luftwaffe, the German Air Force, would just hover in the sky and wait for the U.S. fighters to turn around and head back, and then they'd swoop in on, on the bomber formations. So that really didn't help much. It wasn't until the beginning of 1944 with the introduction of the P-51 Mustang that they had adequate uh, fighter support that could follow the bombers all the way to the target and back. Now, once they got near the target, then they ran into another problem, and that was anti-aircraft flyer. Here's an anti-aircraft gun. It was nicknamed uh, Flak Gun uh, for the abbreviation of the German long word I can't even pronounce for a anti-aircraft cannon. And these fired shells at uh, 20 a minute, and they were calibrated to explode at the same altitude that the bombers were flying. And when they exploded, the shells were full of metal pieces, shapes, all different shapes and sizes that would spread out over a wide distance, and they would easily penetrate the thin aluminum skin of the bombers. You could take a screwdriver and just poke it right through that aluminum skin of these B-17s. Uh, and the bombers, when they went on these missions or returned from the missions, they were always full of holes from the, from the shrapnel. 
When they neared the target, they reached, well, this is what uh, the flak looks like when it explodes, just little black puffs. And so they saw this at a real distance. They're just real small puffs of smoke. And gradually they got closer and closer. These puffs got bigger and bigger. And when they started their bomb run, they couldn't deviate their course at all. They had to fly level and straight. You can imagine the fear in these guys' uh, hearts when they saw this flak exploding and there's nothing they could do about it. At least with the fighters going up against them, they could fight back. But against flak, they just had to sit there and take it. Um, so guys would get injured. If a wing was clipped, the bomber would go down. If on a direct hit, the bomber would just explode and basically disappear. As they neared the target, they reached a point what they called the IP, initial point, and that's when they started their bomb run to the target. And at that point, the first pilot turned the control over the plane to the bombardier who flew the plane through a device called the Norden Bombsight, which was a revolutionary device at the time. It was highly secretive. It was tied into the uh, autopilot of the plane so the bombardier could fly it. And it was basically an analog computer that calculated uh, the speed of the plane, the uh, wind speed, cross wind speed, etc., so that bombardier could accurately uh, bomb the target. Here you see the bombardier looking down through the, uh, the Norden bomb site. On a mission to Frankfurt on February 8th of 1944, uh, my dad's crew uh, dropped their bombs successfully, but their bomb bay was hit by flak, and they couldn't get the bomb bay doors back up. And so that caused a drag in the plane, and they fell behind the formation as it headed back uh, to England after the bomb run. And they were singled out by two uh, Falk Wolf 190 fighters, there's a picture of one, uh, swooped down like wolves or lions coming on wounded prey. And in the ensuing air battle, the Susan Ruth was shot down. However, both Falk Wolf planes were shot down as well. Uh, one piloted by Siegfried Merrick uh, crashed and he died in the plane. The other uh, German fighter plane was piloted by Hans Berger. He was able to bail out and made it through the war. When I was doing my research, uh, Glenda suggested one time that I try to find the German fighter pilot that shot down my dad's plane and I thought she was crazy. There's no way in the world I'm going to be able to do that, but like a smart husband I did what she told me to do. <laughs> And lo and behold, I found Hans Berger. He became an interpreter after the war, so it, fortunately for me, it was easily to, easy to communicate with him. And uh, through various exchanges of emails and telephone calls, he gave me some wonderful insight about what it was like to go up against the 8th Air Force. My dad's plane crashed down in a little village called Mackinwaz. This is a picture of the plane after it landed. It didn't just nose down, it kind of spiraled down. Uh, in the book, there's over 200 time period photographs. So it, you can see everything you're reading about. And again, I thank uh, Paul Delahaye and Jacques Lalot for sending me many of those pictures, but all, also my dad's uh, Belgium helpers sent him a lot of pictures after the war as well. My dad was the last one to bail out of the plane. Uh, he was separated from the rest of the crew. He came down in some trees, oh, probably a half a mile from where the plane came down. And his parachute got hung up, and he was hanging 20 feet off the ground. He couldn't get down. Fortunately for him, a couple young Belgian farmers, uh, Raymond Durvan and Henri Franken, came to his rescue. They got a ladder and helped him get down. It was about 12 in the afternoon, so they told him just stay put and hide until evening when they could come back and get him. Uh, everyone on the ground could see these planes, uh, could witness the air battle, and could see these parachutes of the guys that made it out of the plane, and there were German patrols all around the area trying to pick up these airmen that had bailed out. Well, that evening they came back and took him to the farmhouse of Raymond Durvan's parents, uh, this house is just right on the French-Belgium border. Those trees are actually in France. He stayed there one night, and they didn't think it was safe uh, for him to stay there any longer, so they moved him. The next night, a Belgium customs officer, Paul Till Queen, came to get him riding a tandem bicycle. And they headed out uh, late at night. It was pitch black, raining, 
And my dad couldn't pedal too well because he had hit, uh, gotten hit with shrapnel on one leg and he could only pedal with his good legs when the wheel came around. Well, they got to a hill and they couldn't get up it. Uh, Paul wasn't uh, big enough or strong enough to pedal f for the both of them. So they walked the bike up to the top of the hill and when we got to the top of the hill, there was a cafe or bar there. Lights were on, music uh, was playing, laughter was coming out. And all of a sudden, two German officers come walking out with two Fräuleins, drunk as skunks. And they come up, one comes up to my dad, puts his arm around him and asks for a light for a cigarette. Obviously, my dad didn't know what he was talking about, but fortunately, Paul did. Lit the officer's cigarette and they let him go on their way. They were too inebriated and too interested in their girls probably to pay too much attention to these two guys in the rain. After that, my dad was moved from house to house. Uh, he stayed with various uh, Belgian people. How long he stayed at any given place determined on how brave those people were and how dangerous the underground thought it was uh, to stay there. And he moved around by all different forms of transportation. He would walk, ride a bike, take a bus, ride a train. Uh, they gave him a false ID that stated that he was a deaf mute, so he didn't have to, to talk to anybody. These are two of my dad's closer helpers. You have Ghislaine Bayou. He and her husband, Maurice, uh, hid them for quite some time. And on the right, you have Jeanette Gadin. Her husband was a captain in the, in the French army who had been captured, and he was in a prison camp. And she was uh, arrested on one occasion and, and uh, interrogated and, and beaten, but uh, they didn't keep her, thank goodness. He made some uh, dear lifelong friends from these people that, that hit him over there. Usually when a uh, airman uh, bailed out and evaded capture, the underground uh, did their best to get him out of Europe and back to England. There were various escape routes that they would go through. They would come down through France over the Pyrenees Mountains into Spain and then out through British controlled Gibraltar. But something always went wrong uh, trying to get my dad out. So he finally got tired of hiding and he didn't, you know, rather than being the, the hunted, he decided to become the hunter. So he joined the French resistance and started attacking German convoys. This was the farmhouse that the resistance group called the Mackie stayed in. This was actually in France, just across the, the, the Belgian border in, in Wallers, France. On one, my dad stayed upstairs here in this, in this farmhouse. Uh, this area hasn't changed at all in 71 years. Uh, all the places where these guys stayed are still there, so you can see where history was made. It's fascinating. But on one occasion, he was upstairs shaving, and all of a sudden, a German convoy comes up the road. Well, he's got shaving cream in his face, and he's just in his skivvies, so he jumps out the window, sprains his ankle, and then hightail it into the, the forest so it wouldn't be captured. And the book is, is filled with little uh, incidents like this. Uh, why he was being hidden. There were numerous cases where he was almost captured. I love this next picture. This shows my dad jumping out of a Jeep with the Mackie while fighting for the French resistance. Um, how they took this picture and how I got back to my dad, I'll never know, but it's pretty, pretty fantastic in my opinion. One thing I forgot to mention on an earlier slide when I showed uh, Paul Till Queen, his wife Nellie, after the war, uh, sent a couple keepsakes to my dad, one for his mother and one for his wife, and they were little small crosses made out of the plexiglass of the plane, and my wife Glenda is wearing one of those today. Some of you might not know, but Belgium is really divided in half. The northern half is called Flanders, where they speak Dutch, and it's very industrial. And the lower half of uh, Belgium is called Wallonia, where they speak French, and it's very rural. My dad and the crew came, and the plane came down in the lower part here. And then you can see Charleroi, the map. That is where my dad stayed with Jeanette Gadin and Ghislaine Bayou. And the farmhouse uh, where he stayed was right there with the French resistance. Excuse me. That was also where he was liberated in September of, uh, 2nd of 1944 in Trelon, France when Patton's Third Army came up through France after D-Day. My wife and I have made three trips to Belgium, uh, 94, 2004, and last year, 
Belgian people are absolutely wonderful people. They're so friendly and they're so grateful to this day and thankful for the United States coming to their aid to rescue them from Nazi occupation. Um, every year they have celebrations over there to commemorate the events. And they're fantastic, wonderful uh, events. And they last for several days. This is a poster that they had this last fall of the various events over those uh, days period. They erect a huge tent which seats hundreds and hundreds of people. Uh, this is just a, a partial view of it. They have all sorts of parties in it. They have dances, band concerts, lunches. Uh, dinners. It's really a fun time. The Chimay beer, the local beer, just flows. Uh, the local people are, who uh, man the events all dress up in World War II vintage uh, uniforms. It's just a grand time. They also have a number of ceremonies at various memorials around the area. This picture is of the memorial at Sendron, which is right at the French-Belgian border, where the 9th Infantry first entered into Belgium from France and liberated Belgium. And all the villagers come out, all the local dignitaries come out, uh, the U.S. military comes down, Belgian military. Uh, they're really nice events. This last year, the U.S. ambassador to Belgium, Denise Bauer, came down. And a couple of days later, when we were in Brussels, she invited us over to her residence at the embassy, which was a special occasion. They also have uh, ceremonies at my dad's memorial. This is the memorial to my dad and his crew in Mackinwas, Belgium. On the front of it, you can see two plaques. Uh, they list the names of the crew, their ages at the time that the plane went down, and their positions in, on the plane. Five members of the crew made it back, five of them did not. Uh, the last crew member to pass away died in uh, 2010 at 89. This is Hans Berger today. After the ceremonies uh, this last fall, my youngest son, or our youngest son, went to visit some friends in Germany and he took a copy of my book to take to Hans. He's 91 years old. He lives in Munich, Germany and is a real nice guy. Uh, like the U.S. fighters, you know, he was 19, 20 years old. He had just doing, trying to do a job for his country and trying to stay alive. You know, he considers himself a German, not a Nazi. I love this picture. Uh, this was taken in 2004. My dad wanted to see the World War II memorial before he died. And I accompanied him uh, to go back to a reunion for the Air Force's Escape and Evasion Society in Pennsylvania. And we took a bus down to Washington, D.C. And this picture was taken right before the ded dedication of the memorial. My dad died in 2007. Uh, he was actually the oldest member of the crew to die. He was 91 years old. At one time, there were 16 million World War II vets. Today, there's less than a million. And we're losing these guys at a rapid pace. And when they're gone, all their stories will be gone too, unless they're told. No other event in history uh, affected more people than World War II. 60 million people died, millions of others were wounded, millions of others were homeless and displaced. The brave young men who fought and died for freedom are definitely members of the greatest generation and it's, we can never forget their sacrifice. It's our duty to remember. Thank you very much. If anyone has any questions, I'd be glad to take them now. Uh, first question was, uh, was the German pilot surprised when I contacted him? Yes, he was. <laughs> Because uh, I started bombarding him with all these questions because I wanted to know all these answers. And uh, he was real good about it until I, the one time I started asking him, well, what'd you think about Hitler? What'd you think about the Nazis? And he goes, well, you know, I really don't know you all that well. We've talked over the phone and so forth. You're starting to ask me a lot of personal questions. Uh, but he relaxed and we developed a pretty good relationship. But you could tell that it was painful for him to talk about the war. Uh, most all of his friends died. Uh, in the 8th Air Force, at one time, there was not a mission limit on the number of combat missions you could, had to fly, and the morale just went into the tank. And then, uh, thankful to uh, 
flight surgeon called uh, Thurman Schuler, who was actually in the 306 bomb group, he lobbied the 8th Air Force to, to set a bomb uh, mission limit of 25 missions that was gradually raised to 30 or 35. But in the Luftwaffe, there was no l mission limit. And so those guys just flied until they died or were injured so badly they couldn't fly anymore, like Hans luckily made it through the war. So it greatly affected him. And when, when he, after the war, he was left homeless, basically. He was raised in East Germany, so he couldn't stay there anymore because of the Russians. So you know, he was out of family, penniless. It was a very tough time. They, you know, they thought Hitler was terrific. And, when he first came into power, and he w was for the country, uh, Germany was in deep uh, straits at that time. But Hitler turned the economy around and got jobs for people and uh, developed national pride again. So at the beginning, he was doing some good things. No one knew he was going to turn into this monster that he did. Good question. The question was, how many missions did my dad fly? He actually only flew eight missions. He was shot down on his eighth mission. He would have flown more, but he was center on the basketball team at 6'3". You know, he's a tall guy back then. And he uh, twisted uh, his ankle, actually tore the ligaments in his ankle, so he couldn't fly for two months. And during that time, uh, other members of his crew flew with different other crews. Uh, the question is, uh, how much did my mother know about my dad uh, being missing in action? They were shot down on February 8th, and she got a telegram from the War Department on February 23rd saying he was missing in action. So she knew nothing. In fact, my other sister, Nancy, was born while he was missing in action. All the letters that he wrote to her uh, from England during a pregnancy, he always referred to the baby as Steve or Stevie, but uh, I didn't come along until after, after the war. My mother said I, it, was, it was the best mistake they ever made. <laughs> Um, but she didn't find out that my dad was uh, alive until he got back to England and uh, sent her a telegram in, uh, in September, late September of 44. So it was almost eight months that she had no idea. Here she was. Uh, she had bought a house uh, while he was overseas in Pasadena, a little house. So here she was in a house, uh, a one-year-old baby, pregnant, not knowing if her husband was uh, dead or alive. Had to be tough for those women back then. Uh, the question was, what uh, happened after you we sent back to England, my dad? If you were shot down over occupied territory, you could not fly again. Because the Air Force was worried if you were shot down a second time and you were captured and tortured, that you'd give up the, uh, identi the identity of the Belgium people or French people or underground people that helped you. So they sent him back to the US. He uh, was a flight instructor for a while. Uh, then he, had to, he crash landed his plane in Ohio, and after that he said, forget it, I'm f through flying. He was air traffic controller for a while, and then he did a number of, he owned a restaurant in Pasadena for about 10 years, and then he did uh, numerous other things. Uh, the question was, uh, of the crew that bailed out, uh, did they stay together uh, after they came down? My dad was totally separated. He had no idea what was going on with any other member of the crew until they got back to England. Uh, there were some members of the crew that were in contact for a while, uh, and then they got separated, and three of the crew they didn't know what happened to until 19 months after the plane was shot down. Uh, the question was uh, how many guys died in the plane or how many bailed out. Uh, two crew members died in the plane, the ball turret gunner and the radio operator, and the other eight bailed out. I can't say any more than that. You have to read the book. <laughs> <laughs> uh, the question was, was my dad uncomfortable flying uh, after the war? Uh, no, he wasn't. He enjoyed flying. In fact, uh, in some of his uh, later occupations, he flew all over the country and uh, to uh, different parts of the world, Europe and Japan and different places, so he enjoyed it. Uh, the question was, how often would the crews go up on combat missions? And that's an excellent question, too. Uh, unfortunately, because of the England, English weather, it was overcast so much. Um, they were socked in all the time. One of the worst situations for the crews was when they'd uh, be scheduled for a mission. 
they'd prepare, you know, go through briefing, get all keyed up for the mission, go out to the planes, get in their plane, taxi out, sit there, and then we're told that the mission was scrubbed because they had to go through all that anxiety for nothing. They hated that. Um, so th there, were, there were periods of time where they didn't fly very much at all. Uh, and then there'd be a period of time where they'd go up five days in a row. Uh, there were four uh, bomb squadrons in each bomb group, but only three squadrons f flew on a particular mission. So there was always one squadron that didn't fly on that mission, so they were able to rotate a little bit. But it was really, really hit and miss. Yeah, yeah. And my dad said it was just damp and wet all the time. Everyone got the flu or pneumonia. Uh, every member of every crew was in the hospital for what, some time or another. They all got sick. The question was, was World War II the first war where they used jet aircraft? Well, the only uh, country that developed a jet during World War II was Germany. They had an ME-262 that came in near the end of the war. But that was the only jet that was flying. Um, the question was if I, if I have any of my dad's uh, effects from World War II. He donated a lot of his uh, memorabilia to this museum in Belgium. Uh, they have a little museum there called Musée 4044. Uh, in uh, Monsu Ember Cheese, which is not too far away. Uh, I'm wearing my dad's uh, pilot's ring, uh, graduation ring from uh, advanced pilot training. I don't have his A2 jacket, that's the bomber jacket uh, that the, the pilots wore. I have his original uh, name tag and I have his original patches, but not the jacket itself. I have a Nazi belt that he took off a German tank, a tank sergeant when he was with the French resistance. Um, I probably have a couple other things. I have a uh, bracelet. Uh, if you bail out of a plane in combat, you belong to a club called the Caterpillar Club because the, ca the parachutes are made out of silk, Caterpillar silk. And so I have a, a bracelet that has his name and ID number and the date that he was shot down or bailed out uh, on it. So I have a few things, but uh, like his, his, a lot of his stuff he donated. He was so thankful to Paul Delahaye, because Paul formed this organization called the Belgium American Foundation in the mid 80s to honor and remember the allied troops that liberated their country. And it was the association of the foundation that built all these memorials. And Paul became a dear friend of my dad. So my dad was really thankful to, or glad to donate these things to the museum there. And they have parts of uh, the German uh, Falk Wolf plane uh, piloted by Siegfried Merrick, lots of parts from that plane. So it's a neat little museum, although it's not very big. Uh, the question was, did the Germans have a policy on whether or not they, they shot uh, airmen who were out of uniform? Well, it, it, it kind of de depended. According to the Geneva Convention, if the Germans captured uh, a U.S. military man, they were supposed to take him and put him in a prison camp. Uh, the German army, uh, sometimes they did that, sometimes they didn't. The Luftwaffe of the Air Force was very good. If you wanted to get captured, you want to be captured by the, the Luftwaffe because they respected the airmen. They kind of looked at them as comrade and in, in, in arms some, some, somewhat. And the uh, Stalags or the prisons of the Luftwaffe were much nicer than the, the Stalags for infantrymen. Um, if you went out of uniform, uh, then it kind of depended uh, on what you were doing and where they found you. If they thought you were fighting with the resistance, they'd, they'd shoot you. Uh, all the guys kept their dog tags, uh, even though they dressed in civilian clothing, clothing to try to prove that they were down, you know, the U.S. servicemen to get better treated. They weren't some uh, resistance fighter. But that varied. And uh, that's a big part of the book. Uh, the question was, uh, eight Air Force statistics about people lost, missions flown. Uh, there were 28... Uh, thousand uh, men from the 8th Air Force who died in World War II, more than all the Marine Corps. Uh, 26,000 men were wounded. 
Uh, 17,000 men were, became prisoners of war. I should know how many missions they flew, um, it's in the book, uh, and how many bombers they lost, which is in the book too, but uh, I forget off the top of my head. It, uh, flying air combat was the most dangerous uh, thing to do during the war. On a ratio or percentage basis, you know, the number of men that were fighting versus the number that died. Um, the 8th Air Force had the highest casualties of any branch of the service. Uh, no, he did not. Uh, he was just, the question was if my dad uh, came in contact with any other downed airmen while he was missing in action. Uh, the question was, no, he did, it, it did not. He was just hidden by those uh, different people and then joined the resistance. Uh, the, the resistance group he was with was made up, it was just kind of a hodgepodge of, of guys. My dad said there was a number of Algerians who were really cutthroats and, and fierce. Um, but they were, you know, Frenchmen, uh, guys that escaped from different prisons and so forth. But he never did... Uh, he didn't uh, come in contact with any military person until September 2nd. Uh, on that day, they had, uh, the resistance group had sent a trap for a convoy, but the convoy never showed up, a German convoy. And then he heard that uh, there were Allied troops in Trelone, France, so it wasn't too far away, so he hightailed it over there and then went up to an a infantry a army officer and you know, identified himself. Then after he was interrogated and they believed he was who he said he was, uh, then they sent him back to Paris and then on to England. Uh, well, the question was, was it common for uh, downed airmen to join the resistance? Uh, no, this is very, very unusual occurrence. Um, I'm sure there were some. Uh, I myself haven't read any books about them, but I, there are some, but it was very, very rare. And usually, I mean, I don't know what the percentage is, I should. You know, 95% or whatever of the down there, and 99%, they were captured and became prisoners of war. Uh, there were very few airmen that were able to evade capture, and then a good portion of them, they were gotten out through escape routes. And a number of down airmen uh, were downed after D Day, so they came down and occupied, I mean, not in uh, US controlled territory which they didn't have a problem. They didn't need to really evade. Uh, uh, the, the question is, the uh, two men that were killed in the plane, did they actually die in the plane or they just stay in the plane? Uh, th no, they, they were killed. Yeah, uh, through a 20 millimeter cannon fire from the Fock Wolves. Yeah, they were both killed instantly. Uh, the question is, uh, do I have any advice uh, for Jim and his son, uh, they're gonna take a trip to France to retrace his dad's footsteps who was shot down. Um, as I mentioned, I've been over there three times. I was fortunate the first time to go over it with my dad and with my parents. And so when we went around all these places where he was hidden in the, the field where the plane came down and so forth, you know, I could talk to him you know, live about the events. I wish I had asked him a lot more questions. Uh, and the next two times I went over, uh, just my wife and I. But uh, do a lot of research before you go. Uh, try to find and contact as many, you're going to France, so as many French people that might be involved or be little historians. And when you're there, you'll, people will surface. That'll just say, oh, I knew so-and-so, but they won't be able to speak English. You'll have to have a, a translator there uh, to help you. Uh, but just do a, a lot of research and spend enough time while you're there. Don't, sh sh you know, shortchange yourself. And if you have a doubt whether you should, like, try to find something or go see something, go do it. The question is, did my dad keep in contact with uh, surviving crew members? Yes, he did. Uh, they got together occasionally for, uh, for social events. The bombardier actually moved to Pasadena with his wife, so he saw them uh, more, more frequently. But they, they stayed in contact. Then my dad came back from Belgium. He stayed in contact with the Belgium helpers, uh, writing letters and exchanging Christmas cards. The monument to my dad's crew was erected in 1989. And my dad went back with three other surviving crew members uh, and their wives. And that's when he was reunited 
with Belgium helpers and, and saw these houses where he was hidden. And that really brought everything back. Because like most vets, they didn't talk too much about it. But after seeing that firsthand and being re reunited with his Belgium helpers, he started talking more and more about it after that. Good questions and great crowd. Thank you very much for attending. I really appreciate it. Thank you for watching Peninsula Seniors Out and About here at the Western Museum of Flight and Torrance. I'm Betty Wheaton. I'll see you next time.